Well, very good morning to you all gathered in for worship this morning. Um, it's lovely to be here once again to praise the Lord together. And uh, we're going to do that with our first hymn, a very, very famous hymn, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made. wonderful hymn, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands hath made. Lord, we, if we stop and we meditate, if we uh, clear our minds of the clutter of the things that distract us so much from seeing the awesome glory and beauty, the wisdom of all that you have made, uh, Lord, so often we 
Lord, we lose out on that wonderful sense of the majesty and glory of who you are. For everything that you have made is telling us that you are great. But Father, we think of another hymn uh, that Isaac Watts wrote, When I survey the wondrous cross. Lord, your creation is awesome. Your, uh, the work of your hands in all that you have made, it, it's beyond our ability, even with the greatest of minds, to comprehend, to fully understand and to, to hold it all in. But Heavenly Father, how much more the greatest work that you have done, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, Jesus bled and died to take away my sin. That you commend your love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not an angel, not a perfect man who was just purely a man, but one who was God himself, the Son of God, gave himself in love to save us, to forgive us, to give us eternal life and to bring us back to you so that we, by the Holy Spirit, could cry out, Abba, Father. And Lord, this is the Lord's day. This is your day. And we give it to you. And we pray that you would bless us in it and that, Lord, you would give your Holy Spirit to every one of us right now so that everything we do in our singing, praying, in our listening, that it would bring you praise and pleasure. And we pray all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, children, um, I know that last week we uh, changed course a little bit and we looked on how God has treated us so unfairly in a good way, if you remember that, that he's shown us love and mercy that we don't deserve. Well, I want us to go back to what we've been doing in looking at some Christian heroes. Now, I want us to remember that there isn't a man or woman, even the very best Christian, who has ever been like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to remember that every one of them failed as well. But I want today to tell you about a man called Anselm. Now, he wasn't British. He was actually born in Italy. And he was a Christian who worked in France, and eventually he became the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury. There is an Archbishop today. His name is Justin Welby. Well, this man, Anselm, he wasn't a perfect man, like I said, but there are two things that I think we should remember that he taught. He was a very clever man, and he was a man who knew the Bible. And he was also a man who knew what people who weren't Christians, what they were saying. And, you know, that's a very good thing for us to think about. Because we believe God's word, but it also helps us to be wise to know what other people think and whether it agrees with God's word. Now, the first thing that Bishop Anselm teaches us that is really important is this that if we want to have real knowledge and if we want to understand things the world the universe our hearts what makes sense uh, how to figure out maths and science and all of those things that we can study he said this you have to believe in God first or all of the rest of it will never make sense. That's simply put. There's a verse in the Bible, Psalm 14, verse 1. And it says this. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool. The person who has no sense and who doesn't think. You see, Bishop Anselm, he said this. I believe God by faith, and because reason, my mind, shows that there must be a God. That it's foolishness to say that there is no God. 
So we start with God and then we have wisdom. Have you ever climbed a ladder before? You can't climb the top of the ladder without going from the bottom first. And there's a verse in the Bible that says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do you want to be wise? Do you want to have real knowledge? Then you must start with God, respecting him and believing that he is God. But you know, the other thing that Bishop Anselm taught, and maybe this one is more important, is about Jesus. Is about Jesus. Now, Jesus was God, wasn't he? He was the Son of God. And the Bible says that God is infinite. You know what that means, don't you? Infinity means it keeps going and keeps going. God can't be measured. He's, he's just fuller and fuller and fuller and greater and greater and greater. Well, Jesus is that. And you and I, we're sinners. And we need a saviour. Now, we know that in the Old Testament, the Israelites used to sacrifice sheep and goats and bulls so that they could be made right with God. But, you know, that couldn't make them right with God in the end, could it? If you had a murderer in, in prison and he's standing in front of the judge and the judge says, you're found guilty, you must go to prison for the rest of your life. The murderer can't get a goat and say, well, judge, this goat is, he's going to take my place so I can go free. No, the goat doesn't know what murder is. The goat doesn't know what right and wrong is. It has to be a man. And that's why Jesus became a man. He became a man so that he could take our place, people, so that he could take our penalty and die in our place and suffer what we deserve so that we could be brought back to God. And Bishop Anselm said this, Jesus had to be a man for the reason I've just told you and he had to be God because an ordinary man well, he could only pay the price for one other man, even if he was perfect, because he's just a man. But God is infinite. And so because our sins are against an infinite God, how can anyone pay the price for it except for God himself? And that's why Jesus is God and a man. And when he died on that cross, he could take the penalty of my sin, of your sin, and of billions of other people, all who turn to him and say, Jesus, Lord, forgive me. Cleanse my sin away. Make me one of God's children, please. And he will. And he can, because he is the God-man. So Bishop Anselm, he, he, he didn't die for being a Christian. He didn't suffer in those ways. But he taught us those two great things. You must believe in God before you can understand everything else. And number two, Jesus had to be God himself to pay for our sin. Well, we're going to sing, he made the stars to shine because it tells us about all the great things that God has done. But most of all, that God became a man and suffered on the cross to save us. He made the stars to shine, he made the rolling seas, he made the mountains high, and he made me. But this is why I love him, for me he bled and died. The Lord of all creation, Became the crucified. He also made the sun that shines on everyone. He made the rain and snow and things that grow. But this is why I love him. For me he bled and died. The Lord of all creation became the crucified. 
Is he your saviour? Well, uh, just a few notices for the week uh, to come. It's great to know that tomorrow is our first Monday Club back after what, nearly eight weeks or so of not having it. Uh, the trial run on Monday uh, past went really well and uh, uh, you, you're very welcome to join us if there are children uh, who haven't been to Monday Club before then just email me or, or, or text me or message me um, and uh, you'd be very very welcome for your children to join in. We're starting at six o'clock and aiming to finish it 10 to 7 and it's through Zoom so you'll need a link for that. On Wednesday we've got uh, a man joining us again at 7 o'clock through, through Zoom for our prayer meeting and his name is John Bass and he's a Christian serving as a pastor in Coventry and he's coming to do a Bible study to share on mental health and the local church and, and how we approach that from God's word and uh, helping one another and out there in, in the world. So uh, you're welcome to uh, be a part of that. And if you want to join in with that in our prayer meeting, uh, then please do again uh, make contact with me. Also on Thursday, we'll be continuing our Christianity Explored course uh, with the, the few of us in that group uh, and with Jerry. Uh, and again, uh, don't feel that because you weren't there at the beginning, um, you can't join in. If you'd like to be a part of that on Thursday, starting at seven o'clock, finishing around eight o'clock, then do again contact me and I'll let you know more about it. Well, um, it, it's great today to be able to hear one of the testimonies, one of the stories of salvation of one of the uh, men from our church. So I'm going to hand over to Ian for a few minutes, who's going to tell you uh, what the Lord Jesus has done for him. Hi, my name's Ian. You'll generally find me in all my free time tinkering with old British bikes. It's something that I love. But I want to tell you now about something much more important. My faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was 47 before I became a Christian. I was brought up in a Christian household to go to church. But I knew I wasn't a Christian because the things of Christ were of no importance to me whatsoever. And I think it's important that we understand the natural state of man and the natural state of myself at that, at that time. God's word makes it very clear in Ephesians chapter 2. He says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins and unable to help ourselves. It's like a corpse that is dead. You can offer it all the finest foods, but it won't eat it the simple fact that it's not because the food is no good it's because the corpse is dead and that is the state that we're in we are unable to reach out to god in our own strength because of our sin so i grew up uh, in the normal way was interested in all the things that lads were at uh, that particular time uh, during my teenage years i followed the fashions of the time uh, pursued the interests of the time. Eventually I got a job in the building trade and that sustains me right even up to this day. I raised a family but it seemed all the things that I pursued never really fully fulfilled me. They never really seemed to satisfy. Whatever I wanted I seemed to want something else after that and in fact what I was doing was fulfilling exactly what it says in Ephesians 2 further on. It says, by my nature, I was fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. And then by my nature also, I'd become the opposite of God. My sin was a problem to God. So during my 40s, I found myself single. Uh, I was pursuing a very selfish lifestyle. I did the things I wanted to do, and I did them when I wanted to do them. I became a local district councillor, and I had at one point the opportunity to go and see a fellow councillor regarding a specific issue and it was while I was um, while I was seeing this councillor uh, that the Lord dealt with me this councillor had got cancer now unbeknown to me I wasn't aware of how far down the line he'd gone he was some years older than me and when I went in I was taken back by how poorly he really looked Yet he still opened the local paper and holding his throat because of the pain, 
he was telling me we needed to get a letter into the paper regarding a local issue. I don't remember what that local issue was. What hit me was the fact that death was clearly staring him in the face, yet he was more concerned with local issues. I remember stepping back and thinking to myself, John, if I was in your shoes, I'd be getting right with God, not worrying what the local council was doing. And on that way home, I become very convicted of my own words. If I was to die in a motorbike crash, if I was to fall off a scaffold that day, how would I find myself before an almighty and holy God? The truth is, I've been found without hope and a sinner. So God opened my eyes that day to my sin, my own sin. And you can say, what do you mean by sin? I think we need to be sure what sin is. It's the things that we think, that we say and we do that offend God. And you can say you're a good bloke. You're the same as the rest of us. And the truth is, I probably was. I've never robbed the bank. I've never killed anybody. But the trouble is, I was still a sinner by nature. The things that we think, say and do offend God. When we tell white lies, it offends God. Look at this example. Consider road rage. We've all been caught up and we can all imagine doing things to that fellow driver. We don't do them because we'd be arrested. But because we are capable of thinking them, the Bible tells us we might as well have done them because it's still sin in the eyes of God. So you see the hopeless and helpless state that we're in, unable to help ourselves. There's nothing I can do to bargain with God. I found myself hopeless and a sinner. and I repented of my sin. And the thing, the verse that gave me the most hope is found in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says these words, that God demonstrated his love for us. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That while we were still sinning, while we were still pursuing selfish ambitions and gains, Christ died for us. And I found hope in that. I repented of my sin and I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same can be for you. There's nothing you've done that's too bad. There's nothing that God can't forgive. Whether you're a football hooligan, an hell's angel, a drug dealer, a drunkard, a wife beater even. Christ has died for you. That you can have that same hope that I had. Repent of your sin your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening. Well, it was great to hear uh, what Ian had to share of what the Lord Jesus has done in, in his life and uh, to see how personal it is that God comes to the individual to work in them. Well, let's just pray. Let's, let's seek God again in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord, for what Ian has just shared. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that um, he can testify uh, with all of the things that you've given to him, Lord. We think of uh, the bikes he loves. We think of uh, Sue, his wife, and his family. We think of a stable home and work. And, Lord, everything that, that the world, so many in the world, would, would love to have and so many don't have. And yet, Lord, there is something far greater. Sin forgiven. Peace with you. No fear of death and a home in heaven and a relationship with you every moment of the day. Oh, Lord, that's something that the world craves for. And yet, Lord, it's looking for it in all the wrong places. It's looking for it in human relationships, Lord. It's looking for it in uh, possessions uh, and in popularity, in, uh, in the television or on the radio, in the newspapers. Lord, it's looking for it in, in careers and in, in money and... Oh, Father, you show us, the Lord Jesus said to us, uh, what will it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Uh, oh, Lord God, we do pray that you'd help us all to have your spirit come and give us ears to hear the words of Jesus. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon, me, upon you, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, 
and you will find rest for your souls. Thank you that Jesus is the light of the world. And if we follow him, we won't walk in darkness, but we'll have the light of life. We thank you that your word tells us that when we begin to follow Jesus, that light, that the, the, the day that is approaching when he returns or we go to be with him is like a, a, a light that is shining brighter and brighter every day as it approaches. Oh, Father, thank you for saving me. Lord, once I was in darkness, but you've brought me into light. Once I was in the, the prison cell, as it were, of shame and guilt, and rightly so, and the fear of death. But Lord, you came and that light shone into my heart, into my life, because you're gracious and forgiving. Oh Lord, you should have condemned me. You should have thrown me onto the heap. But Lord, you're full of mercy. The good shepherd came and brought me back. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the good shepherd, that you laid down your life for your sheep. And when we have gone astray, you leave the 99 in the fold and you came after us. You came and you brought us back, Lord. You carried us on your shoulders. You came and you rejoiced with the angels at the return of those who had gone astray. Lord, you are a good God. Father, you are a good, good father. And we worship you. Lord, I lift up my hands, as Paul tells us, that men everywhere would lift up holy hands, Lord. Not holy because I'm holy, but because Jesus is right and good and because we're accepted in him. Father, we come and lift up our praise to you. We worship you. You're good. You're great. Lord, you're majestic in all of your ways. And you have perfectly loved this world. Lord, you... You give to those who hate you the sunshine and the rain. Lord, you, you do good to those who despise you and who break your good commandments. Who, Lord, are, are ruining other people's lives as well as their own. And yet, Lord, you show them grace. And oh, Father, thank you more for just the sunshine and the rain to make our food grow. Thank you for more than just a roof over our head and cars on the drive, and uh, technology to keep in communication with each other. Thank you for Jesus who comes and brings salvation, who comes and deals with all the diseases of, of our hearts, of sin, of pride, of all the things that, Lord, grieve our consciences and grieve your heart. Christ has come, and he's come to set us free. Thank you for freedom in Jesus. Oh, Lord God, we, we thank you for the way that you've answered prayer over this past week, for the way that you've been with us. Thank you, Lord, for bringing Jemima back to good health. Thank you that, Lord, we had a good uh, result from the test that she hasn't had the coronavirus. Thank you for those who are praying for us. Thank you, Lord, that your people pray for each other. We can love each other. We can be there for each other. Oh, God, help us this week to please you. Lord, may this week be the week where people in Thurliston who have been ignorant of you all their lives or have rejected you all their lives, that, Lord, your spirit would come with power to save this week. Oh, Lord God, let it be so. Father, we put ourselves in your loving hands. Keep us because we can't keep ourselves. Keep us from sin. Because that old man loves to come up and tempt us and lead us astray. Protect us from Satan, Lord. Oh, Father, have your hand upon Thurliston. Protect this village from any deaths from this virus, we pray. We pray in faith and we trust in you. Let your will be done. Guide our government, Lord. We pray for the media to be wise with all that they portray, with the questions they ask. Help our cabinet and Boris Johnson to be careful and wise in every decision they make. Lord God, we pray that even though as, as a nation we, we, we want nothing to do with you, oh, forgive us. Have mercy on us, Lord. Lead us, we pray. Oh, Father, hear this prayer now. Be with all your dear people with Christians around the world, some of them suffering so greatly for their love of Jesus. Be near to them. Please grant all that they need. 
And Lord, please forgive us for all of our many sins. We look to you now as we read the Bible, speak to us. Save, Lord, and heal and encourage. And above all, please receive all the glory. Because of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we're carrying on in the Gospel of Mark, but I want us to read as our main passage from the Bible from Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to read from verse 1. Nevertheless, God says, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle, and garments rolled in blood, will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Whew. Some great promises of God there, and we're going to see their fulfilment uh, in a few minutes. We're going to sing um, one more time before we hear the message uh, from God. And it's two little songs that we're going to sing. Um, the first one is a statement of faith in Jesus. Jesus' name above all names. And then with a little pause, we're then going to sing, Search me, O God, which is a prayer as we come uh, to God's word.
want to pray. Heavenly Father, we have just sang that song and we say Amen in the name of Jesus to it. Lord, speak and may all your servants be listening. In Jesus' name, Amen. In Bedford in 1661, a preacher was sent to prison for 12 years. His crime was for illegally preaching the good news of Jesus. He had four children. One of them was a blind little girl. He was the breadwinner before social benefits. His wife Elizabeth was pregnant and while this man was still in prison, she went on to have a stillbirth. His imprisonment could have been just for three months. And he said this, Oh, I saw in this condition, I was a man pulling down his house upon the head of his wife and children. Yet, thought I, I must do it. I must do it. That man's name was John Bunyan, a famous preacher, an untrained man, and yet a man who wrote, after the Bible, one of the best sellers of all times, The Pilgrim's Progress. The world has its hall of fame, and God has his. Like millions of his successors, John the Baptist, who we've been reading about, he was put in prison. The two verses I want us to look at today in Mark's Gospel read like this. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We've already seen John the Baptist and heard his message, seen his method and his great call for repentance from you and for me, as well as the people living 2,000 years ago. And Jesus described John as a burning and shining light. You know, we live in a world today where there are very few who can be described as burning and shining lights. There are many people who want to be in the limelight, but very few who we can look up to and say, there is a man, there is a woman, who in the eyes of God, and even the eyes of their enemies, can only be acknowledged as something that is close to purity in this fallen world. Well, John, as a shining light in a very dark world, he drew the attention of the darkness. And if you remember that I said that when light comes into our hearts, when truth from God's word begins to pierce through, as it were, the veil of our hearts, we react in one of two ways. Either we break down and we plead for mercy and we seek the Lord, or we close the veil and we become hard. And what was movable and soft suddenly begins to solidify and we begin to hate the light. And Herod, who was the ruling king at this time in Judea, he was of the second variety. You see, John had said to Herod that he was wrong in having his brother Philip's wife become his. John declared God's word. John said, you cannot commit adultery. It's a sin against God. He was faithful. And it meant he was put in prison. You know, there's a couple of lessons to draw from this before we move on any further. And here's the first one. True witnesses of Jesus will suffer persecution. Perhaps not the iron of shackles like John experienced or John Bunyan experienced or millions of other Christians, many of them alive today in Eritrea, in North Korea. But certainly true witnesses to the Lord Jesus, they will suffer the stinging steel of chuckles and heckles. You may have experienced it, but Jesus told us that it would be so. For a world that rejects our master, 
and our Saviour, the world will treat us the same way. But the Lord Jesus encourages us and he says this, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. John was one. Rejoice when you suffer for Jesus. But the second thing that we have here is that true disciples of Jesus know that he is the master builder and not us. And that's in two particular cases. Number one, when fruitful Christians die before their time. Now that's a, a non-statement. No, no man or woman ever dies before their time because it is appointed once for man to die. It doesn't matter whether this morning you're a Christian or a non-Christian. God gave the appointed day of your birth and God has the appointed day of your death. And for those who see Christians dying before their time, well, there's a, a good illustration here for you. In Korea, in the latter part of the 19th century, there was a man called Robert Thomas. He was... Um, from the London Missionary Society and he'd gone to China as a missionary but then he felt that the Lord was calling him to go and take the gospel to Korea. He was 27 years old and on a mud bank near Pyongyang in Korea he was beaten to death. Now some would say he's 27. Why, why would he go into that place of risk and danger? What was God doing? God was in control and, and, and a man, an official, a Korean official took the Bible that was in Robert Thomas's hands and he took the pages of scripture and he used it as wallpaper in his house. And not many years after Robert Thomas was beaten to death in Korea, God did a massive work of revival in that country. And even today, the fruit is being born from that sacrifice, from that one who died before his time. But you know, also, we have to remember that Christ is the master builder when a fruitful work that seems to know real advancement in the early stages seems to stall or even come to nothing. Who was the covenant maker with Abraham? Who was the redeemer of Israel from Egypt? Who was the lawgiver on Sinai? Who was the provider of the promised land? Who was the shepherd of Israel? Who is building his church today? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is building his church. And it comforts us and it encourages us to know that whatever happens, just like this disappointment John who was a burning and shining light doing such a wonderful work and now he's thrown into prison what's going to come of this work of repentance uh, what's going to come of the message of the good news of God something far greater because the one who is building the church the one who saved you the one who if you're not a Christian this morning is knocking on your heart's door the time is today He's seeking you. It wasn't John the Baptist, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it tells us that Jesus came to Galilee. He leaves where every rabbi, that means teacher, wanted to be established. You see, there were rabbis who were seeking the attention and the praise of the religious elite. There were rabbis and teachers who uh, were seeking the attention of Herod. And the Roman authorities, they wanted to build a following, following in the same line of all the others who had come before. No, no. The Bible says this, that God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. Jesus leaves Jerusalem, he leaves Judea and he goes up to the north. He goes to Galilee, forgotten by the religious elite. Forgotten by the leaders uh, in politics. He goes to Galilee. 
But you know, th th there's something significant about that. It's not that Jesus just went up there on a whim. God works where he chooses. God works where he chooses. At the moment in the United Kingdom, here in Thurlaston, there's hardness to the message of Jesus Christ. We've wanted to push it all away. There's comfortableness in the UK. You think about this lockdown period in countries in Africa, for example, at the moment, in Senegal, where our friends are missionaries. If suddenly the supermarkets, the shops begin to close down, they don't have the same uh, processes of business behind where everything can very quickly be changed and advanced. No, people begin to starve. People will begin to get hungry. And in many other places around the world, Christian and non-Christian are suffering alongside each other because of lockdown. They don't have televisions to keep them comfortable and, and entertained. They don't have the comforts of life that we have. No, it seems at the moment in the United Kingdom that we're in a day of small things. But go to Iran and there are thousands turning to Jesus Christ. Go to South America right now and there are people in this coronavirus time who are out on the streets on their knees praying to God. Go to China where the government are seeking to suppress more and more the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet it's growing and flourishing. But you know, more than Jesus choosing where to go, and this is more significant, God works where he pre-chooses. You see, God isn't just making wise decisions. God isn't just adapting and reacting, even in a perfect way. We, we can't even enter into that, being able to perfectly react to every changing season and situation. We can't do that. God can, but God has ordained all things already. God is sovereign, not over, um, only over the past, but over the future. God had planned all of this. What did we read in Isaiah 9? This fantastic promise that we remember at Christmas time. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And he's not an ordinary child, he's not an ordinary son. He was going to be the mighty God coming into the world. He would be the Prince of Peace, God bringing peace. Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus says, notice in this first sermon, it's, a, it's like a, a dynamite ser sermon, it's one sentence. And yet it's packed with power. And he says this, the time is fulfilled. Well, if the time is fulfilled and the mighty God has come into the world as he had, the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God coming to us. Where? Well, in the same chapter of Isaiah, we read this. In the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. By the way of the sea in Galilee of the Gentiles. You see, Mark is trying to tell us, and ultimately God is saying to you and me today, I had planned this. This is where I was going to send the Saviour to begin his work. Now this place, Galilee, when Isaiah was writing... 700 years before Jesus. This place was the Syria of the ancient world. In one sense, almost literally, geographically, but in terms of circumstance, you go to Syria today and what do you find? Terror, fear, violence, deceit, selfishness, murder, cruelty. Well, Galilee was a place of gloom and distress, of oppression, of darkness, of the shadow of death. And why? Well, because it was the northern part of the kingdom of Israel. And firstly, the Syrians, and then after them, the Assyrians, they knew aggression all the time. They were the Alsace-Lorraine, you could say, between France and Germany, always being competed after. They were the Afghanistan, where the citizens were always in fear. There was always hostility, there was always instability and uncertainty and fragility. 
Now let me ask you, before I go any further, do any of those words describe your thoughts at times? The feelings of your heart? Your thoughts about the future? Your thoughts about the past? Your relationships with those around you? Your hopes? Your dreams? Your plans? However, with Israel, as with us, this aggression, this oppression, this darkness was self-inflicted. You see, they had rejected their good and generous God. They worshipped others. God had warned them. He said, look, I am the Lord your God. I've delivered you from the land of Egypt. I've taken you out of slavery with a mighty hand. Even though you complained for 40 years in the wilderness, you moaned and you groaned and you didn't believe me, even though I'd shown you my love. When you go into the promised land, don't worship any other gods. But what did they do? They rejected Jehovah, the one true and living God, and they worshipped idols. And you know, that's what we do today. We worship others. We worship celebrities. We worship comedians. We worship pop stars or rock stars. We worship our families. We worship our friends. We worship our Facebook groups that we like. We worship all of these things and we reject the God who made us in his image, the God who desires to know us and the God who is good. And Israel, secondly, they wanted self-governance. Not only did they want to worship others, but they wanted to govern themselves. You know, as we would say, saying to the children, not only is it the fool who has said there is no God, but it's the fool who acts as if there is no God. It's the fool who says, I am wiser than the creator of the universe. And what did we look at last week as Jesus went into the wilderness? That what does he find in every human heart? The natural bent and brokenness. That rather than the bent to do good, though we can by God's grace, we do evil as well. And we heap up in our lives self-governance, self-preservation, self-prioritising. But you know, lastly, the people of Israel, they wished for the passing pleasures rather than peace rather than peace. You see, as they rejected God's, God's person, they rejected his precepts as well, his laws. And God had said, if you turn away from my laws, it will only bring trouble. Yes, it brought trouble as God disciplined his people in love by bringing outside nations to teach them lessons. And then they'd cry out to God and he'd deliver them. You know, how often have people done that? You see people in church when they've got cancer or, or when they've, uh, there's a problem in their family and something's broken and they realise it and they know God is the only one who can help. And they cry out to God and he delivers them. And then they go out and they reject him. And they carry on living in those ways that breaks God's heart and grieves him, but also grieves themselves. You see, how many of us have gone for, there's nothing wrong with pleasure, Pleasure is good. God created a world full of pleasure. But we, what do we do? We twist it and we warp it and we gorge on it and we break it. And we go too far with it. And we know we do. We go against our consciences and we go and we lie in our bed full of lies at times, full of uh, adulteries, full of, um, full of pride. And we know that things aren't right, but we carry on following the pursuit of pleasures that we know are wrong. And we put that above having peace in our hearts and peace with God. You see, this was self-inflicted and it was sin. One, worshipping others. Two, wanting self-governance. Three, wishing for passing pleasures instead of peace. One, two, three, the equation equals sin. You know, I'm sure that in the Christmas carol, Scrooge had a very winsome smile with new customers. And you know, sin's sales pitch is exciting and enticing. I know because I've, I've felt it. 
but it's really a cruel taskmaster and an uncaring conqueror. You know, every one of us are born into sin's kingdom. David, in the Psalms, he said this, In sin did my mother conceive me. Now, he wasn't saying that his mother and father shouldn't have been intimate and producing a child. No, no, God commanded that even. No, he was saying this, that as I was born, I received there in my conception the sin of my father. That nature, that bent against God. But you know, as we grow up, we're all willing citizens. Some people revel in sin. You'll all know of Playboy magazine. Hugh Hefner. And he was interviewed once. And he spoke very openly and freely about the, the wonder and the pleasure of being able to enjoy as many women as he wants. And even to say a woman has a right to, to want to have pleasure with as many men and with their, not only physically, but visually. And the interviewer asked a question which caused him to stop dead. He said, so, Mr Hefner, what about if one of your daughters was a Playboy bunny? He didn't have an answer for that. But, you know, before we look at the Hefners and, uh, or, or, or others, you know, who've done violence or murder, whatever it may be that's against God. Every one of us have reveled in sin to one degree or another. I only have to open up my Facebook or, or read a newspaper or watch the news or just see all of the people around us in Thurliston to look in my own heart to know that we have all reveled in sin. But you know, there are those who revile sin. They realise sin. They realise what's in their heart. And though they want to be as far away from it as possible, they seem to be dragged deeper and deeper. There's no power. There's no strength to overcome it. They're shackled. They're slaves. They're in darkness and gloom. The druggie, the alcoholic, the porn addict. Or you know what, just the normal Tom, Dick and Harry walking down the street where everything seems all right. But in their hearts, they know it's not. But you know, I would say most of us both revel in it and revile it at the same time. We love sin and yet we feel its consequences. We've loved doing things that we know are wrong and that pierce our conscience. And it's like a Jekyll and Hyde. There's no peace. There's no real satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. That's the world's anthem, isn't it? But note, both reviling and revelling in sin, in the end, bring us to debtor's prison. You know, many people in this life, they feel the aspects and the whispers of the consequences of sin right now. They feel that burden, as Isaiah was talking about. Have you ever seen an animal, in, particularly in old days, like a, a horse or an ox, having to have a big yoke on it, carry, pulling the plough through the rocky and hard ground? It's, it's hard work, it's tiring, it's breaking. That's the effect of sin now. Or it feels like a rod, where you just feel that your conscience and your spirit is being beaten all the time. You know, Satan does that. He'll entice you with a smile and then he'll beat you with a rod. Sin does that. But you know, whether we feel the effects and the consequences of our sin now or not, we will all feel the full reality of their consequences in hell. In this life, God is here. God is here with mercy. God is here with benevolence. God is here to provide even to those who hate him, even to the wicked, even to those who reject him. But you know, Jesus said this, in hell there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. In hell, God's goodness has now been removed. 
and God is present in anger. God is present with wrath and he's justified in that. See, the Bible says God does not delight in the death of the wicked. God doesn't rejoice and, and get glad and happy at the destruction of those who he punishes. But he will because he's good. You see, sin has usurped God's rule in this world. And you and I have followed sin as willing rebels. And I wonder this morning, like a parable that Jesus told of a, of a son who left a good father and a good home and he went to a foreign land with his father's money and he wasted it in prodigal living, which means in, in, in everything that he knew would grieve God. And you know what happens? The famine comes into the land and his money is all lost and he's sitting in a pigsty and he's eating pig food and his clothes are rags. I wonder, have you felt like that or do you feel that today? Over your, the state of your heart, over your relationship to God, most of all. You know, there is hope. There is hope. God, the king who we have angered and grieved and offended, he so loves this world that he came into it full of mercy and kindness. Isaiah said, upon us a light has dawned. And it's a great light. Jesus, in his ministry, later on from this, he went into the temple and he cried out with a loud voice. He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of of life. Do you want light instead of darkness? Do you want peace instead of a, of a conscience that pricks you all the time? Do you want hope instead of fear? Jesus the King came to bring that. And here as John is put in prison and you may feel that you're in prison, you may feel what hope is there for me, but there is hope. Because Jesus came to Galilee. Jesus came into the darkness. Jesus came into the gloom and the oppression and the fear of hell and the fear of death. He came into the broken conscience. And he came as the king. He came to proclaim his kingdom. It says here, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. We've looked at the kingdom of this world just a few minutes ago. And Jesus is coming to declare something greater. What is his kingdom like? Is it like the American dream? You think of the millions who flocked over to the United States over the last three or so centuries. Filled with dreams and hopes. But where has it ended for many? Slavery? Xenophobia still there? The Mafia? The Great Depression? Wall Street? Corruption? Poverty? No, but Jesus comes and, and he doesn't declare the American dream. He doesn't declare the Thurliston dream or the, the modern let's get rid of God dream and, and have freedom and liberty. No, it only makes us slaves. He comes and he declares God's kingdom. How does Isaiah describe God's kingdom? It's a kingdom of increasing joy. Like a harvest. Remember, it, not, we can't appreciate it, but in days where the harvest was everything. That's why they had thanksgivings. They'd have parties and dances and feasts. Jesus says, I can give you that kind of joy in my kingdom. The spoils of war. You imagine how it feels for a nation or a people or particularly soldiers who are blooded and wounded. They fought in battle after battle after battle. And finally, peace is declared. And all of their weapons can, can be melted and used into uh, farming instruments to bring life and, and something good and positive. And all their war clothes, all their battle dress is burned on a fire as it's never needed again. And there's rejoicing. Jesus says, my kingdom is a kingdom where you have that kind of joy. And where the yoke is broken. Slaves, slaves to sin, slaves to everything that grieves us and brings us low. There is liberty. The shackles are gone. The addict can be set free. 
the sins that seem so small and yet they hurt us so much, we can have power over them in Jesus. But not only a kingdom of increasing joy, but of increasing peace. Peace with yourself and within yourself. Peace with others. And most of all, peace with God. You know, the Bible says this, that all of God's paths are paths of peace. I know it because he said it and because he has proved it in my own life. You know, so many people think of occupation of another conqueror as the worst thing that could ever happen. With Hitler, yes. But with Jesus Christ, when he comes and he occupies your heart, when he comes and he occupies your mind, when he comes and he occupies all your plans, let me tell you, there's nothing like having King Jesus on the throne of your life. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the wonderful counsellor. He is a father who never changes, who cares for you, who carries you in the hardest times, who brings you into a new home and one day a perfect home. And Isaiah tells us an everlasting home. This is the kingdom that Jesus comes to declare. What do you want to do? Carry on in the world in which we live? Carry on in the state that you're currently in? Or to come into this kingdom... But King Jesus hasn't just come to commend his goodness and his gentleness and his grace, but the King has come to command our allegiance. Heaven's citizens, if that's what we want to be, will enjoy heaven's love. And in love, will obey heaven's Lord. You can't come to Jesus and say, Jesus, give me everything that you are. Forgive all my sin. But you know what? I want to carry on living with myself on the throne. No. The, the Apostle Paul said this, Truly these days of ignorance God has overlooked. But now, that means today, God commands everyone, everywhere, to repent. Jesus comes just like John the Baptist before him. Oh, John the Baptist is in prison and all the people who don't want God to challenge them are wiping their brow with free. Oh, I'm glad he's gone. And then Jesus comes. Oh, here's someone who can bring us back to God and we can still carry on in our old ways. No, that's a wrong spirit. Where the spirit of God is working. You hear those, that word come off Jesus' lips. Repent. Stop going your way. Stop your sin. Stop your lying. Stop your adulteries. Stop uh, your stealing. Stop your gossiping. Stop hating. Stop being unforgiving. Stop being bitter. Stop doing all the things that you know are wrong. And now follow me. Now keep my commandments. But not only is the king telling us we need to repent. But he's also come to call us to receive freely his pardon and his privilege. Jesus says, repent and believe in the gospel. Believe in the good news. Believe that you can be forgiven of all your sin. However wicked you may have been, however evil, however much you've broken God's law, you can be forgiven. Believe in a future inheritance of everlasting life in heaven, in God's new creation, where there's no tears, no death, no pain, no suffering, no dying, no sin, no grief, no sorrow. And believe that you can have a full relationship with the King of heaven, with God as your Father, with the Holy Spirit, a comforter like no other. And it's offered for free. Repent, Jesus says, and believe the gospel. Let me ask you today, let me ask you, do you believe Jesus? Do you believe his words? Do you believe what God's word says about you and how you need Jesus Christ? You need this good news. If you believe it, 
then today repent of your sin. Then today turn away from the paths of destruction and turn to the path of peace. Turn to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus Christ, I believe you. I want to follow you. Give me that eternal life. Forgive my sins. Because I know you can, because you paid for my sin on the cross. Will you repent today? Jesus has commanded it because he knows it's for our good and he knows that one day every knee will bow. And if we don't bow today, we will bow under his judgment and receive for free that offer, that good news. That's what Jesus offers you today. Will you come to him? Will you receive it? In his powerful name, I pray you will. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you take this word and seal it to all our hearts and work in us according to your will and in your kindness and love. Through Jesus, your Son. Amen. The last song we're going to sing is uh, Down in the Valley with my Saviour I would go and then we'll close. Down in the valley with my Saviour I would go Where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow Everywhere he leads me, I would follow, follow on, walking in his footsteps till the crown be won. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow. Jesus, everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Down in the valley with my Saviour I would go, where the storms are sweeping and the dark waters flow. With his hand to lead me, I will never, never fear. Danger cannot harm me if my Lord is near. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Down in the valley or upon the mountain steep, close beside my Saviour would my soul ever keep. He will lead me safely in the path that he has trod. Up to where they gather on the hills of God. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he I would follow on. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God 
through Jesus Christ. The kingdom of heaven is at hand today. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, please, uh, Lord, help us to go with, with your blessing. May this message speak to and change every one of us. You're so good. Bless us in Jesus' name we ask. Amen.